Hello everybody and welcome to the HD 100 series. Thank you very much for joining us. Please bear with us. We've got a complicated panel discussion later on and please bear with us if we do have any technical issues. But my co-chair and I, Laura Benjamin, consultant neurologist, I'm Emma Wall. I'm an infectious diseases physician and we're delighted to welcome you today to this seminar on complex brain infections at UCLH. I'm just going to outline the program. I can make my slides progress, that would always be good. Yes, thank you. Uh, so we're going to start with an overview and history of our neuroencephalitis MDT, which really showcases the cross-working at UCLH between neurology, infection, microbiology, and radiology, and virology. And that's going to be led by Temi and Rachel, who helps establish the MDT. We're then going to go through a case presentation of my co-chair, Laura Benjamin, uh, which also showcases some of the complex management involved in these patients and how the MDT has supported that. And we're going to have a a state-of-the-art seminar short talk from Professor Rolf Jaeger on imaging and brain infection, particularly showcasing new techniques to help us diagnose these particularly complicated patients. And then we're going to wrap up with a, a MDT panel question and a discussion on the complex challenges of diagnosing brain infection. And we'll I'll talk through the panel shortly, but I would ask all uh, of the audience as we go through the first three talks. If you have particular questions um, or issues that you'd like to discuss with the panel, we're not going to discuss specific cases, so we're not talking about individual case presentations, but more, more broad questions around the complex diagnostic challenges and management challenges for these patients. So on our panel, we're delighted this evening to welcome uh, a selection of the great and the good of neurology, radiology, and infection with Mike Zandi and Patricia McNamara from the National Holiday Hospital of Neurology and Neuroscience surgery with Hadi Manji, who is the godfather of neuroinfection uh, within Queen Square, and Professor Judy Brewer and Kat Houlihan, who are consultant virologists, um, and Kat has a particular link uh, with UCLH and the rare and important pathogens laboratories at UCLH, I'm uh, sorry, at Port and Down, and then Professor Rob Heidemann, who probably needs no introduction to most people here, an infectious diseases professor who is director of the Malawi Liverpool Welcome Trust and has a specialist interest in mucosal pathogenesis and neuroinfection. And of course, Rolf Jaeger, who's a leading light in the neuroradiology community and the diagnosis of infection. So I'm going to stop there and ask Rachel and uh, Temi to get started. Please, as I say, as we go through, post your questions in the chat um, and we will raise your questions verbally. You won't be able to ask them yourselves um, uh, to the panel at the end of the talks. Take it away. Hi, so I'm Tim Nabruch. I'm an infectious disease and microbiology registrar and speaking alongside Rachel Brown, who's a neurology registrar on behalf of the Queen Square Brain Infection and Encephalitis MBT. So I'm just going to share our slides now. Did someone confirm that you can see them? Great. So we're going to summarize our experience of running an encephalitis MVT over three years, incorporating both pre and post COVID experience. As a junior doctor, I performed audits on suspected neurological infections in several tertiary care centers in London. The results were consistent with large epidemiological studies performed worldwide. Even in the best resource centers, there is a diagnostic gap, one third to half of cases that remain unexplained. This is disconcerting for the patient, relatives and clinician, a problem both for the individual, but also from a public health perspective. And these cases are frequently complex and may be severely unwell. So it was with this in mind and to improve multidisciplinary discussion for the management of challenging cases that we established the meeting in February 2018. We started with a monthly in-person meeting, initially just a handful of us sitting around a table and reorganized during the first wave of the COVID-19 pandemic to a weekly virtual meeting, open to local, regional, and national referrals. And we've actually had cases from across the UK, including Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. All right, and um, the meeting follows a standard format. Each meeting has two chairs, speciality input from leading experts across the department, in addition to support from regular external collaborators. All referring teams are required to pre-submit an electronic performer and are asked to attend the MBT to discuss their case. Cases and images are anonymized to enable external members to attend. 
formal written feedback is provided after the meeting. And it's been really important having a designated coordinator helping generate each meeting and consolidate documentation. So don't worry, we've got another slide at the end on how you can refer to the meeting. So these data just um, give a summary of what we've what we've covered over the last three over the first three years of the MDT. So during that time, we had 324 discussions regarding 238 patients with a median age of 50 years and a range between one and 91 years incorporating paediatric referrals um, when our Great Ormond Street colleagues join us. And overall, we highlight that this tends to be a very unwell um, population that's discussed. So around three quarters of patients are um, inpatients and around a third are from intensive care. We have a balance of local and external um, referrals um, and also questions relating to diagnosis management or both. In terms of the overview of cases seen, around two fifths relate to COVID-19 or other infections, around two fifths to um, autoimmune or inflammatory um, presentations uh, with a remainder um, accounted for by um, encephalitis mimics um, or cases unconfirmed where we, th those are mainly cases where we haven't had um, the, the follow-up data um, returned to us. I would just say that this data has captured the pandemic period, so there is an over-representation of COVID in this data. And actually, if you look at what we've um, seen probably over the last year, as things have moved to more normal working, we've seen a, a much greater balance with the sort of other, other infections, and particularly um, an increasing number of HIV-related HIV um, presentations. So within the infections that we see, we've seen we see a range of um, viral encephalitis, um, as, well as well as other sort of bacterial, um, fungal sort of um, uh, more complex t TB type, ca type cases. Um, within the um, immune and inflammatory, um, a lot of cases that we see are autoimmune encephalitis, um, with most um, having a seropositive diagnosis, but with a number seronegative um, and, and, and often unexplained, um, some perineoplastic um, and post-infectious cases also. And within the inflammatory group, we see, we've seen a range of um, inflammatory vasculopathies, including um, uh, uh, vasculitis and other, the other things, including um, post-infectious um, conditions such as ADEM. The mimics are quite interesting. Um, we have we've seen a number of uh, neuro neurodegenerative mim mimics. Uh, in particular, we've seen four or five cases now of prion disease, which have been picked up in the MDT, which is very interesting in itself. Um, in addition to a range of psychiatric um, or toxic metabolic um, presentations. And of course, we often see patients who have incidental neuronal autoantibodies. Um, and in those cases, we can uh, reassure the re referrers and um, avoid those patients being subject to unnecessary um, immune treatments. So with regards to neurological infections, different viewpoints and expertise ensure thorough revisiting of clinical history, for example, to consider individual exposures and vaccine statuses. Frequent inputs include recommendations for additional PCR tests, such as astrovirus. This may involve retrieving samples from early in disease presentation or ensuring that correct types of samples are taken. For example, um, sampling other body fluids like throat and stool samples. Intrathecal antibodies can be useful if there's been over a week from onset of illness. The rare imported pathogens laboratory is a fantastic resource and can input on rarer etiologies and provide geographic panels. CSF and brain metagenomics is often discussed and we're fortunate to have access to such cutting edge technology via academic links with Judy Brewer at UCL and Great Ormond Street. An inclusion of cross speciality expertise has also enabled discussion of novel therapies, for example, the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors in PML. So the autoimmune cohort is biased towards seropositive cases, particularly NNDA receptor and LGI-1 encephalitis. And um, what's really tricky about these patients is management, and um, these patients are frequently discussed more than once. COVID has posed a great number of challenges over the last two years. From early in the first wave, unusual neurological presentations were being recognised, and our meeting became a key forum to discuss the many unknowns, including patterns of presentation and likely etiologies. Attendance at the meeting peaked at around 100 per week in the first wave. 
And the experience has culminated in us publishing a case series of COVID-19 related neurological conditions, including encephalopathy, encephalitis, ADEM, and stroke. Detailed neuroradiological input was crucial in this, particularly when discussing inflammatory cases or unusual strokes or microhemorrhages, which became almost pathognomonic for these infections. The feedback has been very positive. We're really trying to learn and develop from the MDT. And um, we have a monthly educational forum at the beginning. In conclusion, brain infections and autoimmune encephalitis have inherent complexity with regards to diagnosis and management. MD input has, MDT input has been crucial in ensuring that all diagnostic avenues are explored and can open doors to novel diagnostics and therapeutic options. Um, it also supports clinicians dealing with unwell patients, especially in evidence-free zones, or often in regional centres where less specialist input is available. So we found it to be a vital resource, enabling pool of experience in the unprecedented scenario that has been the COVID-19 pandemic. And we would advocate for wider participation in such meetings. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge all the people that have made this possible and additional people beyond who's on the slide. And um, I'll just leave this up for a few moments um, on the um, referral pathway for the MDT. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank well, you thank so, you so much, much, Temi and Rachel. Rachel. That's brilliant. I'll leave that slide up for a second just for anyone to take notes, but please do feel free to email us at the end if you've got any questions about how to refer to the MDT. We'll be very happy to do that. Um, I'm now going to hand over to my co-chair, Laura Benjamin, who's going to, she's a consultant neurologist and academic stroke physician, and she's going to present an unusual case of brain infection to give you a flavour of the sorts of cases that we work on um, and that we discuss in the MDT. Thanks, Laura. Do you want to put it in slideshow, Laura, and see if that comes up? Because I've got half your front slide, but then that's it. That works beautifully. Thanks. I just realised I'm muted. Apologies. Um, so learning points um, from this term case is to showcase the NeurID partnership that we have between Queen Square and HTD. Um, and it's not just only in the diagnostic, but also in the management, which has proved really futile. Um, links with um, Ripple, the rare and imported pathogen laboratory, um, and also the encephalitis MDT, again, directing an expert management in consensus in an evidence-free zone, which you find a lot of these cases are. OK, so background. So this is a 30 year old man who's Spanish in origin um, and born and lived in the UK all his life. He's active, at cycles and plays football. Um, he had a partner from Lithuania and two children. He's a non-smoker, minimal alcohol use and no recreational drug use. He had a past medical history of migraine, which is a frequent and mechanical um, um, osteoarthritis arthritis with um, left knee pain and lower back pain as well. So his history, um, well, he travelled to Lithuania on the 11th of August um, and on the 13th, in trying to elaborate on his exposure history, he was walking in the fields, ankle high in grass fields with his kids, feeding on cows. Um, on that day, he also noticed he had a lower back pain, which was worse than previously. On the 14th, he visited rural areas, including woodlands. And on the 16th, he was painting the fence and noted a bite on his feet and complained of sensitivity to his partner and then that's just um, the red circle highlighting the area that he complained about. On the 17th to the 21st of August he developed flu-like symptoms. He flew back on the 21st um, first back to the UK and started taking Lemsip daily suggesting he may have had fevers. Um, on the 27th he had which is now the day he started developing some neurological symptoms, neck tension, photophobia, rigors, back pain um, and that the back pain had eased at this stage. 
On the 28th, he had dysarthria and left leg weakness. He was able to walk, but with a limp. Um, and he went to hospital, had basic investigation. They did a scan to look to exclude quadriquina, which was normal. And he was followed up, discharged to be followed up as an outpatient. The following day, his symptoms progressed. His weakness progressed to his hip um, and he struggled to walk. Um, and over the course of 24 hours, he went into urinary tension, he was constipated and he was febrile. On the 10th, 30th, day four now, he remained orientated but quite drowsy, breathless and easily fatigued. His speech was slurred. And when you look at his vital signs, he was clearly had abnormality with his respiratory system, he was tachypneic, desaturating, um, and stop grade fever, tachycardic, and um, blood pressure was fine, but his FEC in particular was low, and his expected would be 1700 and he was 800. There was no other um, abnormality to note. When we examined his cranial nerve, he had abnormal signs, but they're quite subtle. So broken saccadic eye movements, problems with rapid horizontal tongue movement, and he had a power reflex present. And that was pointing to some form of brainstem dysfunction. When we examined his limbs, um, we showed that he had some abnormality in his upper limbs, but very subtle, um, but largely normal. Um, his most weakness, as he presented with, were in his lower limbs, um, mostly proximal and asymmetric as well, with the left side being more affected. His reflexes um, were generally diminished and absent. So he had uh, what looked like lower motor neuron signs, but with brainstem dysfunction and possibly um, spinal um, abnormality as well especially with his symptoms of renewing, urinary intention. His sensory showed uh, more of a kind of a reticular and dermatomal pattern um, with multiple um, um, dermatomes affected. But again, an asymmetric pattern. I've got a sticky laptop. One second. Is the slide moving at all? Here we are. And um, he had a CT head, which is normal, a CT chest had the pelvis, which was normal, and his blood showed he had some inflammatory markers, raised white cell count, raised CRP. His CSF also indicated some inflammation, um, and his white cell counts were elevated, mostly lymphocytes, and protein was elevated, but not that profoundly. Um, he had a subsequent CSF as well, with, which showed the opening pressure of 40 plus centimetres of water, so very high. Summarising that, he's a 30-year-old man returning travel from Lithuania with flu-like symptoms um, and febrile illness as well, and then developing an ascending weakness with lower limbs, with brainstem dysfunction, sphincter involvement and respiratory compromise, with evidence of systemic and CNS inflammation. So the, the, the differential is broad, um, but we can probably deduce it into being an infective inflammatory or autoimmune or neoplastic etiology. Um, and we have lots of options here, but when we look at the different choices that are available, only a few um, overlap across the board. Um, so in terms of infection that is, and that leads to polyradiculitis, your enteroviruses, your flaviviruses, of which you have Japanese encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, West Nile, virus, tick-borne encephalitis are examples, um, and your herpes viruses as well. Um, and in the sense of inflammatory autoimmune, you have Guillain-Barre, which can give you a central syndrome called Bicostaph encephalitis, um, and also perineoplastic as well. Um, they are, this is not an exhaustive list, and um, there are um, other things that can cause um, etiology across the board, but those are the common ones that we recognise and know. So when he had a scan, um, you can see that he had this longitudinal lesion along his spine, spanning from his thoracic um, down to his lumbar spine as well. And when you look at it in the axial view, you can see that the, um, the grey matter, which is a central part of the spinal cord, was um, enhancing. And it can be quite subtle and easy to miss. Um, and in the initial um, presentation, was missed. So he had an autoimmune extended infection screen and all of this came back negative. I'm sure most of you know the diagnosis at the end, um, um, but uh, 
he came back positive as having tick-borne encephalitis. And I recall this being over a weekend. He came to Queen's Square on a Friday and myself um, and Anna Checkley, who's one of the ID consultants here and, and also part of the um, encephalitis MD team meeting, we're both working together and realised that this is a potential diagnosis, sent the samples to Ripple um, over the weekend and by Monday we had a diagnosis and that was really helpful and, and probably limited in having excessive treatment. Um, and just to show some of the serology and, and RNA and sequencing, he was positive on day six and, and, and in his urine and blood and, and day seven and then became negative. Serology, he was positive um, at day six and also IgM was negative all the way through. And this is just to show the genotype that he had the European subtype there. He initially was intubated. He was started in periclonal cyclovir kept triaxone and amoxicillin. He had TB therapy because we had to be inclusive of things, um, especially because we wanted to give steroids as well. Um, and we gave him steroids um, um, over two days. And this is usually the empirical cocktail that we often give these patients when we suspect infection. Um, and he also started developing transaminitis. And by the time we had the diagnosis, we were able to rationalise and stop most of that. And he was exhibited on day five. His progress over a month after admission, he still had significant um, weakness. He required um, um, assistance to stand and he had sphincter disturbance. It's just a scan to show what it was like in August and how that resolved in October. So just a brief overview of that tick-borne encephalitis. It's a neurotrophic RNA virus and from the Favre virus family. It's an emerging infectious disease and not discovered that long ago. It's transmitted by hard ticks, Exodes rhinosus. And it's important to highlight that this is also the tick that carries Lyme. So actually the vector is there in the UK um, and it, it might just be only a matter of time before this starts being a problem here. Um, there are four, three subtypes, Siberian, Far Eastern and European, and treatment strategy is prevention, i.e. vaccination. And this is just to demonstrate um, where the most prevalent areas are, Czech Republic, um, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. Um, and just to say that the impact of climate change is certainly something that is changing the evolution of this and the distribution, and it's, the incidence is definitely increasing. This is just to show the viremic and um, serological patterns um, and tell you that most people are asymptomatic um, and, and, and also meningitis might be a manifestation of meningocephalitis. But to say that myelitis and radiculitis, radicula, polyradiculitis and also brainstem involvement are very rare. So the learning points from this is that this is TBE is an emerging infectious disease and we should consider the diagnosis when we're traveling traveler from endemic regions. But the question is, we know when it's an endemic region, but there's also that threat that it could move to other places. So how do we handle that when we're not familiar with the regions where these viruses evolve to? And that's something we can talk about in this discussion. The importance of vaccination, and he's someone who's a routine traveler there, he wasn't vaccinated, and if he was, he would have saved and spared himself these disabilities. Um, and also the importance in engaging with a rare and important, um, important pathogen laboratory. Ideally via the ID team um, early for returning travellers because they have more geographical panels that they can test for that you may not know about. So thank you very much for listening and I'd like to acknowledge all the people who contributed to this case. Um, thank you. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Laura. That was a beautiful overview of the case. Um, w please think about your questions and put them in the chat. We'll address them at the end with the panel. I'm now going to hand over to Rolf Jaeger, who's going to give us an exemplary seminar on imaging and neurological infection. Rolf, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, just see whether you can see the slides. Yeah, we can see them. Can That's you see beautiful. the cursor moving as well? Not at the moment. You can't see the cursor moving. OK, uh, one second. Then let me get and do the screen share. Sorry. Uh, I'll unshare. So just while Rolf's preparing that, we've had one comment in the chat so far from Evo that says, I believe that TB has already been detected in UK ticks. I don't think, as far as I'm aware, Laura, that there's been a UK case of TBE that we're aware of. 
Okay. Great, Rolf, start off. Can you see the window and the cursor now? Looks good. Yeah, good. So uh, thank you very much, Emma and Laura, for inviting me. Uh, the title is slightly provocative, but usually that's what I call the standard imaging, the off the peg uh, T2 flare DWI and pre and post contrast T1. And what I want to talk uh, today about is the use of a more advanced or dedicated sequences, which are FISP imaging, diffusion tensor imaging and high B value DWI, uh, susceptibility weighted imaging, and then also vessel wall imaging and MR perfusion. So that's a lot to go through, but uh, I'm just showing some highlights of that. Uh, the true FISP is a sequence which is in clinical practice normally used for Im imaging the IAMs. You can see seventh and eighth nerve complexes beautifully and the vestibular schwannoma. So the main um, features are that it's high in uh, myelographic contrast. It's got a high resolution, um, uh, spatial resolution, and the flow is compensated. So how can we use this? The first few cases, it's really from the neuroparasitology MDT uh, with Hadi Manchi and Peter Chiodini. And this is a patient with intraventricular cysticercosis. Now, intraventricular cysticercosis are very difficult to detect on T2 or standard sequences. As you can see here, there's a lot of flow signal. It's not high resolution, but there's absolutely no problem to see that cysticercosis here uh, coming through the foramen of Monroe and a further one in the fourth ventricle. The patient has also been shunted, so you can see the shunt here. And this is one of the sequences. It's a must sequence if you want to check also treatment response in interventricular cysticerci. Here are coronal reformats. So this is a 3D sequence, and the coronal reformats really show again here very nicely the cysticerci, the scolex, the shunt, and what's important, the scolex is actually bright on DWI. So this uh, is another sequence that's very useful. And then you see the small daughter cysts around. So uh, coming to another uh, parasite where a cyst sequence may be very useful. This is a patient from the series we wrote up with uh, Patricia uh, Schrutzkova about um, uh, it, uh, intracranial hydatid. And this is a patient with cystic, uh, with cystic echinococcosis. You can see standard T2 imaging, then the cyst sequence, and you can already see some structure in here. And if you blow this up, you can see there are internal structures, rims, and uh, of note, there is no high signal on the DWI, like in the scolex and cysticercosis. And this is really a protoscolex formation. You can see here in the progress, remarkable resemblance to the histology. So this is what we can achieve with this cis sequence. So diffusion weighted imaging is probably a mainstay in infectious diseases. And I was asked to show some classical cases. So here's a classical case of a ring enhancing lesion. And then we have uh, a bright on DWI and dark on ADC. So that means heavily restricted diffusion. And this is of course a posterior abscess. If we compare that to another ring enhancing lesion, which has no high signal on DWI and is not dark on ADC, and if the discerning eye may detect some uh, target sign, so this is a toxoplasmosis in HIV. So that's our daily bread and butter. But as I mentioned already before, um, there are other um, uh, utilities, especially if you have patients with single cystic lesion, and um, we have with Hadi Manchi saved a few people from the surgeon's knife, uh, when we actually showed a scolex of a cysticercus, which is bright on the DWI sequence. Uh, and that's another feature to look out for. And especially the South American cysticerci, they can become quite large cystic lesions. So how often does that occur? This is just a paper from my Brazilian colleague and friend, uh, Leandro Lucato in Sao Paulo. They looked at uh, how often does this occur? Well, it's in the vesicular and colloidal stage. It's about a third. So it's really useful if it's present, then you can make the diagnosis. But if it's absent, then it doesn't exclude. And of interest, if you come to the granular nodular stage, none of those lesions showed diffusion restriction. So this is a take home point uh, to save patients from surgeon's knife. Now, what about diffusion tensor imaging? Now, these are images which are with six directions. So they take minimally longer than DWI. And that's from an article we wrote with Hadi 
uh, in 2013, you can see fractional and anisotropy maps. So you normally you should strongly orientate it um, white matter tracts bright, but the, the damage is here dark and it's much easier to detect than on the ADC map or on the standard imaging. So this is uh, again here uh, an example where the fractional anisotropy map shows subtle damage more markedly. Now in HIV, we often have the, the question, what are the white matter lesions? And here we have some white matter lesions which are confluent, diffuse, they're not really symmetrical, uh, but it's HIV encephalopathy, typically symmetrical, but can be asymmetrical. And if you look at diffusion weighted imaging, as opposed to the ADC map, you often see almost nothing because it's sort of competing restricted diffusion and T2 effects. It looks very bland. But another lesion, uh, which is PML, shows this flame-like edge. So we have a high signal uh, at the periphery, and Rob Miller always compared it to the Australian bushfire. So this is the burning edge, and that's the burnt earth, uh, as it were. And we detected very early that if you do high resolution uh, B3000, so this is not the routine um, B value, and that's more sensitive to slower diffusion, you can see this edge and this rim more uh, more more clearly uh, than on the B1000 image. And one of my students from Italy, Claudia Godi from Milan, she compared um, a series of, uh, we've routinely used it at uh, UCH and HIV, and she compared how the B3000 image compared to the B1000 and what the core and the rim how they relate and how they differ. So here is just a take home message. If you're not quite sure, it looks blurry. It could be a um, PML, think of uh, using a B3000 higher B value, which gives you, of course, less signal, but it could maybe more characteristic. And another disease um, which uh, we investigated with Habrit Yari, um, uh, whom I also supervised in her PhD, was uh, in CJD. And if you use a B3000, you may see both in sporadic and invariant CJD more pronounced changes. And the same goes here for the ADC values. You see the hockey stick sign in the um, variant CJD is much more pronounced on a B3000 than on the uh, B1000. And we could um, back that up with measurements. Coming to microbleeds, which uh, were already mentioned previously in the talk. Now, the standard sequence is used uh, very often is a T2 star weighted image, which is good because it is sensitive to hemorrhage and blood products, and it shows you more than a T2 weighted image. But if you add susceptibility weighted imaging, uh, then these lesions become much more apparent and you see more. Um, and this is also discussed in our uh, paper in radiology. Uh, so the technique is that you have a magnitude image and you multiply it by the power of four typically or 10 uh, with a phase image. And then you do various tricks in image transformation, which increases the susceptibility artifact. So the reason I'm mentioning phase image and this technicality is also because you can exploit it to another use. If you think uh, sorry, just to, to wrap up, uh, in SWI, we found that you detect about twice as many uh, microhemorrhage or susceptibility lesions than in T2 star imaging. Now, I mentioned phase imaging, and uh, one thing to exploit is actually it can distinguish between iron, which is paramagnetic, and calcium, which is diamagnetic. So these are the dipoles uh, which go in different directions. And here you see a patient with microbleeds in uh, CAA, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, they appear dark with a white rim compared to the choroid plexus, which appears white with a dark rim. And if you look now at the um, calcium, which is diamagnetic, in a patient with calcified cysticercosis, it has a dark rim and a white center. And blowing this up, you can clearly see the difference between microbleed and microcalcification. I must add at this point, this is worth, uh, this holds true for Philips, where if you use a Siemens scanner, it's the other way around. It's just to do with whether it's left or right-handed, the, the scanner. And of course, these uh, calcified cysticerci, they show no longer restricted diffusion, uh, as I mentioned before. Um, so, in the COVID epidemic, uh, we saw a lot of microbleeds and we saw them in quite typical locations. Uh, we saw them frequently in the corpus callosum, in the internal capsules, 
uh, and also in the middle cerebellar peduncles. First, we thought this is a feature which is maybe a typical or, or pathognomonic, uh, but then if we look back, uh, this is um, just now, uh, sorry, I wanted to mention a result a study which is under review at the moment. We looked at uh, 458 MR scans in acute COVID patients um, between five centers led by Stephen Kramer and myself. And here are the ischemic and hemorrhagic lesions. Now, if we look at cerebral microbleeds, which are in these regions that involve the corpus callosum internal capsule or cerebellar peduncles, uh, they were more frequent in ICU patients, 25%, and in non-ICU patients, only in 3%. And the other microbleeds sparing these regions were really uh, less well seen. Now, what is this due to? Similar experience, uh, Charing Cross Group wrote up 10 patients with COVID and microbeads, and these are the heat maps, so they found similar distribution. But the question here is, and that's discussed, uh, are these actually uh, symptomatic of uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection, or are these uh, an epiphenomenon of severe systemic illness? And the potential drivers would be uh, in systemic inflammation, the corpus callosum has a high concentration of cytokinin and glutamate receptors, hypoxia, coagulopathies, endothelial dysfunctions. And if we go back, this is a paper from Javier Romero from the Massachusetts General Hospital, um, and that was really pre-COVID. He showed this susceptibility etching in a number of conditions, uh, including influenza, sickle cell, uh, lung transplant, and actually these were not uh, in in one or two patients where they got uh, post-mortems. These were intravascular thrombi, not extravascular microbleeds. So that's another possible etiology. And of course, looking back, uh, this is a patient we had uh, recently, uh, who, uh, a tragic case of a 24-year-old who was in Ghana, had fever, and she was actually told uh, that it might be COVID and not to go to hospital so soon. Uh, but it turned out to be malaria, and she had cerebral malaria. Here you see cytotoxic edema. And on the uh, very early scan on SWI, you didn't see just hints of microbleed, but just one week later, that's how her brain looked like on the one5 and then uh, uh, sometime later on 3Tesla, these were the uh, microbleeds and susceptibility etching in malaria. She didn't test positive for COVID. And I had to, of course, dig back into the archive. This is the first report with Anna Chakli, where we had a, a case with afroentrepreneurosomiasis showing also these uh, cases. Coming quickly now to the uh, vessel wall imaging. Um, as my friend Luke van den Howe always said, we looked for years down the hole of the donut, but now we can image the wall and see what, what is on it. This is a technique which is relatively recent, and the crucial thing is in, uh, black blood, so there shouldn't be any flow. Uh, you can do it in 2D or 3D. 3D is better if the patient can still keep still because it's a longer sequence, and you can reformat it and you see vessel wall enhancement here. So. Uh, two cases here. Um, this is a case with vasculitis, and we can look at the, um, uh, the perfusion imaging, either with uh, arterial spin labeling, where you don't have to inject contrast, or with uh, gadolinium perfusion, uh, and, and assess the effects. Now, if we look at one case, this is a 24-year-old uh, woman with AML presenting with left ataxic hemiparesis, mild narrowing if you look down in the middle of the donut in the MRA. But you see actually here there's a vessel wall enhancement, and not only there, but also the vessels of normal caribou show vessel wall enhancement. And this turned out to be uh, VZV uh, PCR positive, and of course the vicinity of the trigeminal ganglion to the carotid siphon favors propagation. One of the first patients we used that um, uh, technique was a patient who had infarcts, repeated infarcts. She was young, had a seronegative arthritis. Some irregularities showed up on the uh, MRA, and then there was marked vessel wall enhancement. And if you blow this up, uh, this turned out to be herpes simplex virus. PCR was positive in the CSF. And... Um, she was fortunate because she made the diagnosis and then she received a troper treatment with high dose antiviral and immunosuppressive treatment. And we could see here the uh, disappearance of this and uh, the vessel wall enhancement decreased 
also the perfusion. We showed here a delayed arrival of a label spin, that's arterial spin labeling, that had normalized. And we use that now routinely in our vessel wall imaging protocol at UCH, uh, MRA vessel wall imaging, and then ASL perfusion. And Laura just um, had successfully rebutted the last reviewer of our paper that's now in print, in brain communication um, or in press, uh, showing that you can use this to monitor treatment effects. So ASL perfusion in a patient who had immunosuppressive therapy, which was not very uh, efficient, and then the adjustment of the treatment regime showed to improve uh, perfusion. So that's maybe an exciting uh, tool, which is also accessible and not very complex uh, to use. So if we look at pathologies, we have vasculitis where the wall goes, uh, involves all three layers with inflammation. Reversible vasoconstriction syndrome is normally the medium layer. And um, that has uh, initially been reported as not showing vessel wall enhancement. And then we have atherosclerosis, which is eccentric. Now, uh, for, uh, here's an example of an eccentric atherosclerosis, um, which enhances if the block is active and can lead to some, especially in, in recent stroke. Now, things are, of course, not as simple. And there's an excellent review by uh, Moshe Basha, uh, who is also one of the pioneers of that technique. And he looked at intracranial atherosclerosis, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, and then inflammatory vasculopathies. Now, the pattern of enhancement of the wall is eccentric in 90% in atherosclerosis. In reversible vasoconstriction syndrome, it's not always absent. It can be actually only present in uh, just under half. Uh, so it's useful if it's absent, but if it's present, then it's a problem. And the inflammatory are overwhelmingly eccentric, but can uh, concentric, but can also be eccentric. Now, to wrap up, I want to show you three cases of HIV. I, I, I was just going to intervene, and you're showing my yeah. paper. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, Roth, I have to wrap you up though. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, fine. Then uh, we will we'll leave that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rolf. Can I ask the members of the panel now to put uh, their cameras on? And Rolf, stop, please stop sharing your screen. Yeah. And then uh, Laura's going to kick off with the first question. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, Rolf, thank you. I think a lot, I need to emphasise a lot of those sequences you were sharing, you've pioneered a lot of them. And um, if that didn't come across, um, I just need to emphasise this to the audience that, you know, SWI, vessel wall imaging, you know, that's Rolf who's done that. And well, I'm here. Thank you very much, Laura. But I also want to say these are not sequences that are really uh, esoteric and that can't be used widely. Uh, so uh, that's uh, it's not something that's only possible at UCH, but of course it's been pioneered and, and, and how they can be used. Great. Um, have we got Hadi on the line? No. OK. <laughs> Um, so, as an, I was going to start off in, as I must acknowledge Hadi anyway, even though he's not here. Um, he's, he's really kind of the, the godfather of New ID at Queen Square. And in yes. two weeks, he's here. He's here, but some technical difficulties getting the mic. OK. OK, brilliant. And, and, and in two weeks time, he's actually going to get the ABN, Association of British Neurologists Medal, for all his hard work and, um, and pioneering work he's done and, and service he's contributed to NeuroID. So I was going to start off Oop. with you, Hadi. Can, can you hear me? Uh, I right. can. I just got on. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, as in, you've been here and seen how NeuroID has evolved through time. Um, what has been the highlight for you? So, I mean, I think what's clear is that one of the positive benefits of COVID was it pushed us to use all this remote meetings because I mean we used to meet with Mike once a month and and Chandra and Rolf and really the the whole COVID pandemic forced us to use this which is going to be a long-term thing um, I think for the future but in terms of what's made a huge difference is no doubt is Rolf and all his colleagues with neuroradiology which makes life so um, easy to some extent uh, and then we've got this whole group of people from UCH who've interacted so Kat and Anna to, to for the diagnostics really and you know Judy and I qualified together and for 40 years we never met and now we meet every week you know it's, it's actually astonishing 
Um, and and so I think the the important the changes are the imaging and the 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 the, the microbiology and virology. And I think the future is going to be with with metagenomics because I mean one of the problems is trying to get rapid diagnoses of of these infections patients really. Um, yeah, so thanks, Hadi. I was going to lead on from that because I totally agree with you. Um, and one of the beauties of the MDT for me has been linking the radiology with the virology and the metagenomic expertise. And I wondered if Kat and Judy wanted to just give a brief comment about their experiences, both with liaising with Ripple and liaising over the metagenomics, and um, particularly in terms of time around time and samples and uh, uh, the latest data, particularly Judy, around metagenomics and results that you have. Kat, why don't you go first? You're UCLH. <laughs> well, maybe I'll touch on the, the the ripple side and leave the metagenomics to you. It's uh, uh, but the certainly in terms of um, what's been really useful for me is start. I started out in neurology and then I've got this uh, fifty percent job at Ripple and a lot of infection non diagnosed encephalitis cases come to Ripple because surprisingly the, there's lots of travel history around and it will. It's been quiet for two years, but I expect it to increase and it's. It's really exciting to be at that interface, and I and I probably will be referring. I've referred several. I'll probably refer more tropical cases into the this MDT just because it's so incredibly useful. Um, and just what I mean, it, it, in terms of metagenomics on brain biopsies and CSF, yes, really important. But I think Laura's case really illustrates. Um, if anyone was eagle-eyed enough to notice, the the PCR was po negative for tick-borne encephalitis in the CSF, positive in the urine and blood. We don't see things in blood very often with these flaviviruses and with many viruses causing encephalitis, but we see immune responses in terms of IgGs and we see virus secreted in urine. And so the uh, hopefully the benefits of linking in um, through me and, and through talking about this more and through thinking about tropical and imported infections is we remember to send additional samples and uh, it would be nice if we could expand our metagenomics to pick up uh, those infections in urine and blood and we just need to start expanding and to look at serological profiles for viruses that we don't traditionally pick up so sort of expanding our serological and there are lots of methods Judy's nodding her head there's lots of methods that we can use and that we'd love to explore um, in terms of serological diagnosis of these infections so it's an exciting place to be and so it's really great to, to be linked in with the MDT. So Judy do you want to comment and then maybe Rob you have some comments yeah. as well. Um, I, I completely agree with Kat I think we're just at the beginning so we started doing metagenomics about six years ago because in in Great Ormond Street we have a lot of very immunocompromised patients and that that the yield in those patients is is in children with um, you know acute encephalitic um, uh, um, presentations is, is very, very high. But I completely agree with Kat, we're just at the beginning. So we've got the standard methods going. We now need to move on and, and optimise them further and to, to really think about where we're going next. And I think um, metagenomics of combined samples. So I, I would like to see us looking at uh, combining the stool, the urine, the throat swab, the brain, the CSF in one go and being able to work out um, you know where the where the pathogen is. Um, I'd like to see um, proteomics, um, you know acute proteomics where we can actually pick up or, or um, um, phage display um, uh, uh, methods where we can actually pick up the antibody um, in those cases where we can't uh, make the diagnosis on a, a, a pathogen. Um, we need to talk about um, increasing the, the speed with which we do these methods, increasing the sensitivity. We're now looking at combining um, the um, a sort of enrichment method with a, a metagenomics method. So, you know, all of that sort of thing. We need to look at the speed. There are, there are newer methods like nan nanopore sequencing are not very helpful at the moment because it's not sensitive enough and it's too many errors. But all of that, it, we're just literally at the beginning. And then not to forget that um, you know, uh, uh, com um, combining this with all the kind of metadata uh, that come with the patient. Um, and it would be nice to be able to link the, the sort of, you know, to have a kind of algorithm that's sucked in from the electronic patient record, all the bits and pieces you needed, um, all the, because it's standard. We all ask the patient the same thing when they come to us with an encephalitis, you know, depending on where they've come from. We need to be standardizing this and putting it into automated algorithms so you basically get a diagnosis rapidly uh, rather than having to wait weeks. Um, and of course, you know, the um, digitalizing all the um, imaging 
to to um, uh, to to to, to um, enter into that whole algorithm. So that's that's where I hope we're going in the diagnostics, and that's what I'd like to see happening in my lifetime. Judy, that was a fantastic overview. Rob, do you have any comments in your uh, clinical and research experience? I, I guess first to to reiterate that the history is always important. I mean, I mean, I think all of these tests are are, are key, but in terms of actually then directing the appropriate uh, tests, actually thinking through um, the, the the contact history, travel history, and so forth are are, are really important. Um, I guess to reiterate that you have to know where to look and so TB is an interesting thing isn't it where you don't have a positive PCR in the CSF but you have it in the blood and I don't know whether that's because a lot of the manifestations of the neurological syndrome are immune mediated. Um, uh, uh, I don't think that's that's well um, uh, understood so looking, uh, looking in the right place is important and I guess the third thing is as Judy says, is that the diagnostics is on a really steep upward curve at the moment, I think. And and so given that these conditions are relatively rare, I think it's really important that as many samples as possible get referred to the appropriate laboratories so they can gain the experience and, and perfect their techniques, because otherwise we, we you know we will lose that uh, momentum, I think. Great. And I just want to throw one question back. Presumably we're still at the early stages because my very small experience of metagenomics is that you generate a lot of data. Um, and how do you start assigning causality to that? Um, it's a really good question. And, and Kat and I have got um, a direct experience of that because we're involved in you know looking at data now from the acute hepatitis in the UK uh, affecting children. So um, we, we, we're grappling with all, all sorts of questions like that. We have a very strict um, set of um, uh, criteria that we try and meet. And, and that absolutely means we have to confirm in the tissue that the um, new pathogen is actually causing disease. And the best way to do that is immunohistochemistry, in situ hybridization, um, that, that sort of thing, where you can actually see the pathology. So, you know, the histopathologists are really part of this. Um, and you can actually see the pathogen doing its bit. Um, and you can, you know, stain for it in, in relation to the cells in which you find it. Um, and, and so confirmatory in the initially confirmatory work is absolutely critical. Once you've made that diagnosis several times, it then becomes part of the routine panoply. You know, you don't you don't bother. We don't bother to confirm that herpes simplex is a cause of encephalitis. We just accept it. But initially, when you first get a pathogen, you absolutely have to do that um, long, you know, that sort of more long winded approach. Otherwise, you can't um, determine causality. And ultimately, you know, really, it would be, you know, that may include the epidemiology, the serology, you know, you know the sort of longitudinal serology, um, you know, all that side of things needs to be part of the routine process of proving that pathogens really are associated with the clinical picture that you're seeing. We can find them. Are they real? Is is always the question. Great, thank you. Um, a question for you, Rolf, and you have your hands up, and then I want to ask um, Mike and Patricia collectively. Um, Rolf, I'll let you respond first. Uh, yeah, uh, just um, thank you very much. I think we're all learning together because we have numbers where we say this looks, for example, on vesicle imaging like an inflammation, but we can't find a pathogen and we can't find any uh, sort of systemic condition. So we are good at detecting, but we also have to learn what it means and where it comes from. So I think we're just really at the beginning. And some of the reviewers, they asked, you, how do you know you didn't perform a biopsy? Well, you don't often perform biopsies of the middle cerebral artery, at least not at Queen Square. And a quick question about um, vessel wall imaging, Rolf. Do you want to respond to that? Um, uh, I haven't seen the question, um, sorry. Um, um, as if Cat uh, um, Cassif was asking, um, does this need a new software or can we request our to our radiologist? Um, it's not it's not so easy. Um, it's a three D vessel wall imaging you have to buy. Uh, so the, uh, the other you need a, basically a, it needs a physicist to set up, but you can do it with most existing machines. Okay. The danger is if you just do three D volume with contrast, then you you get flow and you may misinterpret things. Great, thank you. Um, Mike and Patricia, Mike, to you especially, because in our MDTs we always get that question of how do you untangle infection 
and autoimmune? That's often the question that we get. Is this infective or is this autoimmune? Um, what's your approach in handling that? And, and then for Patricia, the post-infective syndrome, especially when they start, they keep on persisting. You've had experience with that in COVID. How do you untangle that? I have to ask you to be brief because I know we're running out of time. Big question, small response. <laughs> it's a challenge. <laughs> Shall I start with the um, immune side? Please. Yeah, so I come mainly from the immune, autoimmune and cephalitis side. And I think, as Rob said, it's the history is key. I think one of the nice things of the MDT is the responsiveness, responsiveness of it. We can bring clinicians, junior doctors on the ward to the MDT. We can guide their history taking. Uh, and a lot of people come back again and again. So there's there's some training uh, in there. There are some common scenarios that are a bit non-specific. So the patient with a fever, mental status change, slightly abnormal scan. It could be infectious or it could be immune. And generally, we always want to treat infections first. So a common thing for neurologists is have we excluded infection, which is a very hard, easy question to ask, but obviously we can never say you've um, excluded an infection. But I think when we've got all the infectious diseases, people there, the neuroimmunology lab, colleagues, everybody together in a kind of like a Formula One pit stop. Um, you can get, you can really uh, help pragmatically uh, do things very quickly. Um, a couple of interesting examples that come up. I saw somebody recently, for example, her herpes encephalitis, it's proven, but then they get worse, the imaging gets worse. Is this the NMDA receptor encephalitis, which we know can be triggered by that mainly in children, or is it the natural resolution, the natural history? Uh, and there you you really need a whole uh, suite of people. The neuroimaging is is very useful there. I must acknowledge, I'll let Patricia talk soon, but the I must acknowledge the neuroimmunology lab members too, because another thing that they do is they've got very rapid testing. I think we've got the fastest testing in the country, so you can get autoantibodies to the brain, the NMDA receptor LGI-1 within a day or two. Um, and, and so you get you know, patients being referred in from a district hospital and you can get a really fast service. That makes it a really fun thing uh, to be part of this team. Great, thank you. Patricia? So very quickly then, um, I suppose about post-COVID, I suppose it's like Rob says, it comes back to the history and it's about it fitting in with the typical post-COVID syndrome that we've seen now, which is, you know, headache, cognitive symptoms that are attentional, just executive, sensory symptoms that don't necessarily fit into a neuropathic or radicular syndrome. But it's also, I think, just doing basic neurology and infection and cardiologists going back to, to your history and making sure you're not missing other things. So we've picked up people with, uh, you know, B12 deficiencies and vitamin D deficiencies and other things because everybody's focused on COVID and not thinking about things that they would have done previously when they saw people with memory problems and headaches and sensory disturbance. So I think they they tend to follow a very typical pattern and they all, when you see lots of people with post-COVID, it becomes quite easy to recognise that pattern. But I guess if you're only, if you're a GP only seeing a few people, it would be much harder. But I think most of it just comes back to taking a good history and going into each of the sections. So the headaches, the cardiac side, the respiratory side and dividing it out and just approaching them and trying to treat those the way we would have treated them anyway beforehand because there isn't a specific post-COVID Treatment. Obviously, the genome antihistamines have been a benefit in fatigue and some of the more mast cell type activation symptoms, but there isn't a specific, you know, post COVID tr treatment so far. And also, we're still trying to learn what the etiology and why people get post COVID and what's driving it. And there are different phenotypes within that as well. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll stop talking now because you need to finish. Sorry. No. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Laura. And thank you to the panel. I'm looking forward to seeing you later, those who are able to come and join us for uh, panel dinner. Uh, but thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, thank you for all your input and comments. I'm going to pop the last slide up now, which is just to advertise the next MDT. Uh, so the next, next MDT, I'm thinking too much about MDTs. Mm -hmm. um, 
which is um, going to be an earlier time point in the 19th of May between 6 and 7. It's going to be on Leishmaniasis, chaired by Anna Checkley. So I do hope for everyone who's signed up to this seminar series, you can join us for that. And I'd like to end by thanking the panel. We, we're we going to carry on the conversation over dinner, but this sort of conversation can carry on for hours because these cases are so fascinating and it's such a fast-moving field. So thank you to everybody for your comments. Thank you for the beautiful talks. And I'm going to end there. Good night, everybody. Great. Thank you very much.